because I want to read it directly. And then you guys will decide of when this was stated. Oh, man. So this would be easier to Google. I guess not. But basically, someone wrote the following where they said, well, this sounds easy, but in the future, there will be shitcoin, nitcoin, and he named all of them. And he said, why would you want 50, blo 50 coins per block when you can have mine, which is like 50 coins every two minutes? And this was written all the way back in 2010. Uh, so some people did see this coming, and they still saw that it was just going to be Bitcoin. So this is uh, my four part Venn diagram that separates the old coins between other proof of work coins, uh, proof of stake coins, ICOs and airdrops, even though almost all proof of stake coins have to start with ICOs, and blockchain databases, and then things intersect. We'll uh, skip the white paper, and then I have to talk about where the word blockchain actually came from. And originally it was in the Bitcoin source code where it says nodes collect transactions into a block, hash them into a hash tree, and scan through nonce value to take blocks hash uh, to satisfy proof of work requirements. When they solve proof of work, they broadcast the block to everyone and the block is added to the blockchain. The word blockchain was never in the Bitcoin white paper, which a lot of people just don't remember. And the concept of proof of work is really important. And Seyfedin pointed it out really well in his book, uh, The Importance of Proof of Work. And it was not even in the book. It, was in the, it wasn't even part of the book. It was in the footnote of that book talking about the economics of burning electricity. Because if the electricity is burned for something valuable, then the electricity has not been wasted. Here's one of my favorite slides. I don't know if Peter Todd is still here in the audience. And I'm just going to read the very last part. Personally, I like the idea of hash cash. If and only if it's structured like a real currency as opposed to simply proof of work. In the real world, you pay for resources used. In many cases, this should also apply to a peer-to-peer -peer and other computer systems. Of course, getting hash rate, of course, getting hash cash Workable as a real currency is extremely difficult. I've thought of a scheme that would work. Coins are signed by the owner and can only be changed, signed to a different owner by the owner, except you need a decentralized, centralized database of all the hash cash that's been minted. Unworkable, shit, spend twice problem again. This is Peter Todd trying to create proof of work that Satoshi did. And he was doing this at 15 years old in a conversation with Hal Finney through email. Okay, So when you hear someone creating something better than Bitcoin, remember, some people have been trying to solve this problem since they were 15. Uh, again, going back to Seyfedin's work, um, hard money by taking the question of supply out of the hands of government and their econo eco economists, uh, propagandists, would force everyone to be more productive uh, to society instead of through the fool's errand of monetary manipulation. International economic summits are convened uh, uh, throughout the world to determine the, the general part of how much they want to devalue their currency. And that's what makes Bitcoin really hard money. Um, let's go straight to the whole shitcoin angle and talk about uh, the biggest competitor, or they think they are, Litecoin. Uh, the work of Charlie Lee. I know Bobby, you're right there in the back there, uh, the brother. And uh, so Litecoin uh, tailored itself as the silver to Bitcoin's gold. And it took me, it, I really had to read it from Seyfedin's book as to why the silver to Bitcoin's gold doesn't make sense. And that's because once gold became the backing of paper currency, gold was able to be used at any scale. And therefore, there was no longer a need for the monetary aspect of silver. Um, silver has been a better money than gold for thousands of years. 
but that's because people 2,000 years ago also had to buy their coffee. And uh, one gram of gold was just too expensive. So silver was utilized. But in the modern technical age, um, you can use gold at any scale. The government just you know, decided to cut that aspect of it. But technologically, gold could be used at any scale. And therefore, we don't need a silver to Bitcoin's gold. And that's what Litecoin uh, tries to create. Uh, there's other cool slides in here, but we're going to skip it and we'll go to the panel. Uh, so what do you think about the idea that an altcoin that is faster and can handle smaller transactions is, can somehow succeed in the long run alongside Bitcoin or better than Bitcoin? May I start? Uh, all right. That's not going to happen. And here's the reason why. Bitcoin is the one that's actually decentralized. And the immaculate birth that Bitcoin had all allowed it to uh, be decentralized because the people that were coming in weren't buying it necessarily to, um, to get a return, like every coin after it. So the people that bought Litecoin, even back in 2011, they were buying it with the expectation that because of marketing, because of whatever, that they would have the ability to cash in later for more. And that, uh, for whatever reason, seems to be one of the conditions under which decentralization is allowed to emerge. And it's an emergent property, property that happened as a result of a bunch of things, including the you know, sort of slow monetization process and Satoshi disappearing and a lot of other things. But we don't really know how to add decentralization to anything that's digital. We really don't. And that's the, that's the hubris of Silicon Valley, that they think they can just slap the word decentralized onto anything that they create and think that it's true just because they said it. And that's, that's just being delusional. So faster, whatever, it doesn't really matter because the most important property isn't there. And that's decentralization, which means that you and I can have self-sovereignty over our coins. Everything. Jimmy said, plus there is a very common misconception. It's similar to what we discussed this afternoon about Monero, and we discussed the privacy, but how you use Monero if you have to spend Bitcoin to buy Monero and vice versa. Same stuff happens with this, uh, with this notion of having a store of value currency and then a transactional currency, which is less secure as a, as a store of value, but it's very, very cheap to transfer. So how does that play out in reality? I own Bitcoin because that's store of value. So now I want to transact. So I have to transact Bitcoin to a market out of my cold storage. I change, so that's a Bitcoin transaction with a cost and a, and, a, and a time of confirmation. Then I buy Litecoin on the market, which is basically market fees, and I have to spend time and to spend money. Then I move Litecoin uh, to, to the other party, but the other party is not storing Litecoin. So we have to move uh, from the, to, to spend money on the market as a market fee for conversion and move it back to the storage. Of course, you may say, this is, so it's, f it's three transactions plus two market swaps instead of just one Bitcoin transaction. Uh, somebody may say, just batch, right? You buy a lot of uh, Litecoin, you keep them for a few years, you do a lot of back and forth, and then you get back. There is a little problem. If it's a losing store of value, you cannot afford to keep it for a long time in order to batch effectively. Compare that with the Lightning Channel. With the Lightning Channel, you can have both because you have your store of value in cold storage. You move it to a channel, then you use it back and forth for a lot of times, and then you move it back. But the price of the asset doesn't devaluate during this batching period because it's the same asset. So in a way, light, light network Bitcoin is the silver to uh, on-chain Bitcoin, which is true also, if you think about that, you say, Tone, that divisibility is not a problem with anything digital, because that's true, I mean, it's just digital, so you can divide it. But we, can, we may say that on-chain Bitcoin have a slight divisibility problem. It would be a nice divisibility problem to have because like dust limit, but we cannot pay something under dust limit on chain, not effectively if we are not miners. Uh, Lightning Network solves divisibility problem. So, Lightning, so LBTC, meaning not liquid, but in this case, Litecoin, uh, sorry, Lightning Network BTC. So the Lightning Network is the real Litecoin. <laughs> uh, I'm happy we have Litecoin. It's a, a financial testbed for Bitcoin improvements. You want to elaborate on that? Well, I mean, we tested SegWit on Litecoin first. And 
be, uh, well, it's like a, yeah, it's like a, it's like a poor man's test net for Bitcoin, and it, rich it, man's test. Uh, r- yeah, yeah, I guess. Scammers test. Yeah. So, uh, did you say homeless man's test net? <laughs> what? Did you say homeless man's no, 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 test net? No, no, no. He said a poor man's. He said a poor man's test net. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rich scammers test net. <laughs> yeah. So it it, it gave us uh, an opportunity to 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 have a smaller scale implementation test of uh, a live tested but still unproven uh, implementation uh, that ultimately ended up being rolled onto Bitcoin. So Litecoin is kind of a weird edge case. Uh, I, th- I think the conditions for why it started are kind of disingenuous, but uh, u- ultimately that having that is kind of valuable in that usually they end up rolling out the potentially riskier components to Bitcoin, and we get to see if Litecoin blows up first instead of Bitcoin. All right. Um, let's jump over to, well, that's actually a good slide. This is uh, this is from Luke Dash Jur, and uh, this is going back to 2013. And I'm just going to read it verbatim as to what he wrote back in 2013. Litecoin and other scam coins like it, on the other hand, do not bring anything new to the table. They're just mere clones that retain the pump and dump nature of Bitcoin, but without the innovation that makes Bitcoin viable as a currency. Litecoin specifically made three irrelevant changes. They changed the proof of work algorithm. They made a faster block, which he explains is not actually faster based on uh, confirmations and the security of the network. And they have a larger currency supply, but one Bitcoin is divisible by eight decimal places. So even one micro Bitcoin, not even a Satoshi, uh, has more units than a single Litecoin. All right, so let's jump over to privacy coins. Uh, What do you guys think about Monero and uh, the earlier discussions of, you know, the coin joins being demonized by the government. And if, since Bitcoin was not anonymous at the protocol level, uh, do you think that the privacy element of Bitcoin is uh, good enough? Uh, we already made fun of Monero a little bit that it's like one, what, 100th the volume of Bitcoin as far as usability. Uh, but how confident are you guys that Bitcoin will have sufficient enough privacy to, you know, make Monero irrelevant? Well, I, I repeat myself, so I'll be super quick. I already said that this afternoon. Uh, privacy is technology plus liquidity. If you miss liquidity, if you miss anonymity set, your technology can be perfect. But if you all, if you are the only one using it, it's completely irrelevant for privacy. So Bitcoin has good enough privacy and a huge network effect guaranteeing liquidity and anonymity set. Uh, p- privacy coins, uh, uh, in the w- best case scenario, which is Monero, they still have smaller liquidity, and you have the same paradox that before. You have to sell Bitcoin to uh, to buy Monero and so on and so on, and so you lose privacy. And in the best, in the worst case scenario, like Zcash, they are they look like designed as uh, privacy only honeypots, basically, uh, because everybody is transacting with the, tec- the same technology of Bitcoin with a smaller anonymity set. So again. Uh, Lightning Network is the real Monero to Bitcoin. <laughs> yes. I'll say, um, I think a, g- a good way of thinking of it is that uh, privacy, uh, to the extent it is important in Bitcoin, it is important for Bitcoin security more than it is important as a consumer feature. It's not, it's not an option that people seem to care about as much. If it is really vital for Bitcoin, it's in the sense of uh, fighting uh, sophisticated government attacks and privacy allowing to escape that. However, I think the reality of it is that um, compared, if, if we compare the use case for Bitcoin and the demand for Bitcoin, compared to the demand for private transactions on blockchains, we're discussing completely different orders of magnitudes of volume. Like the, the, the demand for hard money is essentially infinite. The demand for performing a private transaction on a blockchain is extremely niche. And I think, you know, the, there are several uh, very hard data points that we can look at. We've had Monero and Zcash and several uh, privacy coins for a few years. They've barely accumulated any market cap. People aren't interested in holding those. And um, even with Bitcoin, I think, you know, if you look at it, at least a quarter of all Bitcoins are uh, held on exchanges under KYC accounts. And probably at least another quarter is easily 
identifiable and linkable. And it's, it, I, I think it's, it's pretty clear that the vast majority of people are here for you know, the, 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 the groundbreaking underlying technology behind Bitcoin, number go up. They're not here because they want to um, do private transactions. You know, there are more convenient ways of buying drugs. Um, and but there aren't more convenient ways of getting hard money and everybody needs hard money and not everybody needs to buy drugs online so I think it's it's wh whether we end up having this kind of um, demand for privacy on the first layer is I think an open question and ultimately I think uh, if Bitcoin continues to survive if Bitcoin has uh, got a continuously growing liquidity along with the killer app of number go up then s uh, privacy is going to be increasingly easy to implement on second layer solutions and that's why i agree with uh, giacomo that yeah lightning is the real uh, uh, privacy coin <laughs> yeah i mean i i like uh, some of the stuff that they've done um you know like implementing confidential transactions and so on uh, but there are some serious problems with Monero. Like your, the UTXO set never goes down. It only goes up because you literally cannot prune anything off of that blockchain. And those transactions are gigantic. So the wrong number goes up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the wrong I like that. The wrong up. number goes up. Somebody should tweet yeah, that so, out. <laughs> so it, and it's, uh, you know, the transactions using range proofs and so on are, are enormous. Um, I, I think they're transitioning to bullet proofs and so on. But... I, like the the real feature of Bitcoin that Bitcoin has is the fact that you have a 21 million limit, and this is a very credible limit after 11 years. With Monero, that is not that credible because there could be an inflation bump. They've had one before, and there there could be all sorts of ways in which uh, you know bad things can happen on their network if any of the math breaks or any of the security assumptions don't hold up. So, uh, you know, and like this is something that I talked about on the panel that I had before, but being, being notified or being, uh, having that inflation bug be obvious to everybody on the network is a very important feature. And, uh, and despite, you know, the, the privacy stuff, it's, it, it's interesting, like all of these privacy coins, most of them have very low market cap, relatively speaking. They're, the, the stuff that's like, much more of an obvious yeah, scam like Tron or Cardano or even Ethereum have way higher market caps than these privacy coins. So like as Safe was saying, you know, the demand just isn't there per se. And, it, and that's something that we have to take into account as a community is that you know, there are loud people that really want privacy, privacy, perfect privacy, but there are you know, reasonable steps that you can take uh, if, uh, you know, like, to, you know, uh, hide your coins a little bit, and that might be good enough for most people. Weren't we pro Tron as maximalists? I'm missing some. Oh, maybe we will discuss this later. Okay, sorry. No, no, <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> Wait, you can be pro Tron? That's possible. Only, only ironically. Ah. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. Tone. All right. No, we had a question, but uh, we're gonna move right along. Um, so speaking of privacy coins. They need funding. Uh, anybody's thoughts on Zcash? Uh, the inflation is interesting with it being paid to a fixed group of people permanently. Isn't that Well, not seeking? permanently. They're out of money because it was only for four well, years. Well, they're, they're out of money in the sense that they, their debt tax is no longer covering their expenses for uh, Zuko's company. And, uh, and you know, the, this tends to be a problem in a quote-unquote decentralized blockchain project where they're not getting paid directly um, and they, they have to rely on price appreciation. Um, and you know, I, B, BCH is going through this right now and they, they have a bunch of developers that are not happy with their pay so they can hold the chain hostage in order to do that. So um, this, uh, like, it, it's interesting because you have something like Zcash and you have something Z Classic same exact code base, one has a pre-mine and one doesn't. Why does the pre-mined one have more value than the one without a pre-mine? And the answer is better marketing and better developer support. But you're paying for that developer support with that debt tax. Now, now, that, now that's not insufficient. Uh, a lot of these guys in the next five to 10 years as these shit coins go down will be quitting. And that will be a glorious day. 
because they'll actually be doing something useful instead of just constantly rent seeking. So I love when your decentralized privacy coin is so decentralized that you create a US-based legal entity and you trademark a logo and you, and you threaten to, to sue whoever uses the logo. And it's so decentralized that you have a CEO and the CEO gets money directly from the protocol, like hardwired. The protocol knows the address of, of, the, of the guy to, to give money to. Very decentralized. And it's so privacy that it's bootstrapped with a trusted setup where uh, people are sc like, like Peter are scammed into some very complex security circles, but then nobody can actually verify the image of the initial software that they're using. So it, everything is useless except for marketing. And it's so privacy that most of the people think they're using some magic cryptography while they are using the same technology of Bitcoin on a smaller anonymity set. O and older Bitcoin. Older Bitcoin. Even. Older Bitcoin, yeah. yes. An older version of Bitcoin. And the few people using the, the shielded transaction, they are basically four, and so they have less privacy than people using MasterCard. So uh, that's a great decentralized privacy project. I think, you know, I, 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 surprising enough, I think you can add to that. One more thing about Zcash, which is you know, it, it's marketed as if, oh, we're going to allow people to do what Silk Road did, but we're going to do it much more anonymously. And somehow that uh, it seems to get all of this uh, incredible marketing and media coverage and support from very high-profile VCs. And uh, I just think there's something extremely fishy about the fact that all these highly public uh, people um, are supporting this project, which is basically saying, hey, we're going to build something that people are in jail for. So, you know, I'm not telling you to be paranoid, but you probably should be. Well, maybe we should also be very suspicious of Mimblewimble then, because that, that, that certainly had the same effect. I've not followed that one. I've stopped. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm realizing now, as I go through this slide deck that I started making about a year ago, and I'm zooming in on some of these altcoins, and I'm realizing how irrelevant they actually are today. Like Z Zcash, Dash, Steemit just sold itself to Tron. And uh, I, but I, 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 I never understood Steemit. I really didn't get it. Like it's just a. Oh, no, I got I it. I'm but, paying uh, content <laughs> providers in an in a there were fluctuating. There were a central bank uh, that were printing their own currency and using like stories were, as an excuse. Weren't there yeah. two different Steemits? Like there was three, like Steemit three, dollars, three, three. and then there was like Steemit power, and yeah. then there was like Steam tokens. Yeah, I don't understand. <laughs> it was yeah, yeah. No, I went through it, every yes. page of that white well, paper just to try and understand it, but I think the best part of that white paper was. Steam it, it's, this is, I'm quoting the white paper. Steam it pays people to figure out who should be paid. This kind of thinking is revolutionary. <laughs> That's in the white paper. Sounds like Michael Bloomberg's presidential campaign. <laughs> uh, so I got to go back to this chart of Mount Stupid and uh, where is it right there and it takes about you know one and a half years in the crypto space before you start realizing where the value actually is and then it takes another one and a half years on average to really understand that it's going to be Bitcoin so around that three-year mark you start to really appreciate uh, the value proposition of Bitcoin uh, so that's been uh, that th that's been reality. We have very tasty on here as well as one, <laughs> um, and I that didn't work out it. very well uh, with the SECs. And this is the ICO craze. So I know the the whole 2017 ICO boom. I I I thought people were smarter than that. Uh, where do you think we are these days with the whole? ICO mess. I mean, I thought people were smarter than it in 2013, but no, people love getting scammed. <laughs> I thought they were, I mean, it's surprising to me that they didn't learn in 2011, right? Like, I mean, that that era, I mean, none of those shit coins you really know except for Litecoin, right? Like Tenabricks and IX coin and I0 coin and Fairbricks, which was Charlie's other clone of Litecoin, which he did before Litecoin, but 
he didn't market it well, and then he realized, okay, well, I need to market this better, and then that that became Litecoin. And yeah, I, it, it's it's crazy that uh, ICOs were a thing, and I I still can't believe that. I mean, I I still can't believe Ethereum was a thing. I still remember in 2013 when I heard through the grapevine that this was what Vitalik was planning. That I was like, there's no way anyone would fall for this. You're really gonna give your valuable bitcoins for a pre-sale of a token that might not ever come into existence uh, and yet that somehow happened so well yeah. speaking of ethereum it now has a lot of competition not only from other scam coins like eos and tron and uh tezos but also linked to the bitcoin network like rgb uh, liquid side chain and even RSK, even though RSK had to eventually make a token. So, what do you think about RSK versus RGB versus Liquid? And is that the killer app that's going to eventually show Ethereum's true colors? So, I don't think we need any killer app at just time. You say that you need three years to appreciate stuff. The problem is that there is a lot of new people coming, so the, the total amount of uh, lifespan for a, for a well, uh, well launched scam is not three years. It's probably three plus three plus three. I would say around maybe seven to nine years, uh, as long as uh, you could have some kind of. Uh, uh, some kind of dot com, uh, long term dot com, or protocol bubble in the early 90s about the internet. So you can have that kind of lifespan. Uh, of course, you can have scams that go on for millenniums, like, I don't know, astrology. Sorry for everybody. But, or, but uh, thi this kind of stuff is probably more like th they have to touch deeper chord in, in human soul. So uh, for Ethereum, I, I think what is crazy is that uh, the, ICO, uh, the ICO bubble is still not popped because Ethereum is usually considered something different from all the ICO scams that it enabled, but Ethereum is not just the base layer for uh, ICO scams. Ethereum was a ICS ca ICO scam, uh, j just that. So uh, th it's true that some of the things that people try to do in a very uh, in a very messy way in Ethereum, some more serious people are now, they are now trying to do that either in on Bitcoin, uh, some, some capacity or outside Bitcoin, like for example, assets. So the idea that uh, since you have a decentralized anti-double spending system, you may also leverage that in also to uh, prevent double spending on something which is not native money. It's in theory a good idea because you, you can just leverage an existing network. So it's not a stupid idea itself. But uh, the problem is that for Ethereum, that was not the, the, the principal narrative. Ethereum changed narrative every few months. So at the beginning, Ethereum was Bitcoin 2.0 uh, with assets. Then Ethereum was the clean uh, Bitcoin with proof of stake without uh, destroying the environment. Then Ethereum was like the world computer with perfectly scalable Turing completeness. Then Ethereum became basically the, the base for ICO and Lamborghinis. Then Ethereum beca became DeFi and uh, basically d do the same thing that Big Macs can do, but this time uh, with a sloppy centralized uh, computer on uh, Infura uh, data center. So the, 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 the you know, the, the, the narrative of Ethereum changes every time. One of those narratives was, for example, uh, more extended, more flexible script. That stuff was not doable that way because having extendable scripts during complete on chain is completely stupid. But now uh, Blockstream is working on simplicity, which is like in a reasonable way to have more flexibility with script. And uh, you want to have a generic asset. Okay, now on Liquid and Rootstock and RGB, you can have uh, a generic assets done in a way that makes some sense uh, from an engineering point of view. So uh, Ethereum changes. So s Ethereum uh, went across so many narratives that of course some of those stuff will eventually be realized in a, in a way that makes sense because they just they just said everything and the contrary of everything. Can I still don't understand DeFi. Like the the, the irony of a, of a of a like a company going through the the legal nuances and loopholes to raise money in any known way, and then stating that they're going to release a product that competes in an industry, such as Wall Street, where there are an infinite number of, of pages of regulations around the things that they do. I, I just I don't get, how, I don't understand these people. I don't, I don't understand how they think this can work. I think, I th I think the real value proposition of DeFi is just that it's a very convenient excuse to sucker people into holding on to their Ethereum for a longer period of time. 
And so you set up this whole lending, um, you know, mo three card Monte game where everybody's moving money around and paying everybody interest, and everybody thinks like, you know, that they're playing serious business. Um, but really, it's just a great way to lock up Ethereum and to prevent number from going down, which is Ethereum's killer app. Yeah, I, I, the thing that I've said is that Bitcoin is about being your own bank. Uh, Ethereum is about being your own central bank, and that's what these things are. Is you know, you you have this lockup, which which is one lever that they can push, uh, proof of stake, whatever, um, a, as a way to restrict the supply, and then you can always uh, you know issue more or to. Um, you know, use some other pegging mechanism to make it go up or down. And this is why a lot of these have sort of like these weird price uh, prices that seem to stay stable for a long time because it's being centrally managed, honestly. Now, I could, I could say this as uh, somebody that worked on color coins back in 2013. The idea of a ce uh, centralized asset on a decentralized chain, I thought was going to be a killer app back in 2013. Turns out, no, that's not really the case. It's a bunch of people that would love to issue stuff that doesn't mean anything to other people uh, in order to sell, right? Like that's that's really the it, it it's a it's a scam enabling thing is what I realized. Um, I, you know, a, at least when I was working on it, I was thinking, okay, well, you know, instead of you know having to go through the SEC uh, to issue a bond or whatever, they can do it on this. That's not what it's used for. It's used instead for people that want to make print their own money, be their own central bank, and uh, you know uh, benefit hugely from from that idea. If I may, just just contradict you a, a little, contradict you a little bit. I think that uh, the idea itself. I mean. The, the, the people is using tokens in order to scam people, and that's true. But I'm not sure that we want uh, a very, very uh, ugly, unsustainable uh, architecture uh, to be used by people scamming people. I think it would be better to have people using good technology to scam people. Uh, because, for example, I mean, uh, if we had people scamming people instead of over the internet, over the IBM or Xerox networks, that uh, we would be worse off. So it's good that if we have usage, even scammy usage, that's still a stress test. So I'm okay with having people, I mean, like malware, uh, like, uh, like ransomware, uh, I'm okay that ransomware are asking Bitcoin. They are stress testing, they are mo showing an application which is unethical, so not to do that, but it's still a stress test. And there may be some very, very niche, in my opinion, legit uses for token. For example, digital collectibles and some kind of uh, regulatory arbitrage games, uh, like if you want to have plausible deniability over Tether because you want to tell the, to tell the regulator that you cannot uh, blacklist Tether because they So there may be some niche cases. I agree with you they are not important, and I agree with you 99% of tokens are just uh, Ponzi schemes. But, uh, yeah, you know, as there's still some interest there. Yeah, I, basically the, what, what they're trying to do is print their own money. And if you did that like in real life, right, printed your own money and tried to distribute it and stuff like that, you get arrested. Um, and this is their way of avoiding that regulation essentially that's that's and that that seems to be the main way in which it's used maybe 5 10 20 years from now things will change and there will be actual use cases that that make sense but i haven't seen it yet all right well actually i have one of giacomo's tweets up there and i'll just read it out for you guys bitcoin maximalism uh which i've now recently changed to shitcoin minimalism um, also known as the moderate common sense theory, you didn't put the word theory, uh, Bitcoin could succeed maybe. Uh, it's in the middle of the spectrum, actually, and uh, the other two extremes are Bitcoin cannot exist, which is your Noriel Rubini, or the multi-coiner, which is Bitcoin is infinitely replicatable and my clone is best. That was a great tweet, Giacomo. Thank you. My moderator uh, soul is always uh, the best. Uh, I mean, uh, centrist. All right. Let's just do one more topic real quick and uh, before we just take some audience questions. And this is, so I did this presentation alone uh, back in London uh, with uh, Craig Wright in the audience calling out uh, the whole fake Satoshi. And uh, uh, basically this was another Venn diagram of mine 
that kind of combined um, Bitcoin forks and outright Ponzi's. And uh, there you go. And right in the middle, you have your free Bitcoin hex. But, uh, but let's talk about Bitcoin forks and uh, what's going on over there. So the forks are forking. The, they were all friends. And then they weren't friends, and here comes that uh, the hard fork that created that split, uh, Bcash and BSV, and now we're about to get one more um, as they are about to split again. These are the lawsuits and all of the evidence of uh, fake documents by a doctor, Craig Wright, uh, also known as fake Satoshi and other Satoshis. Uh, this was, let me see, do I have that slide in there? Uh, we're going to skip it, but just your thoughts on Bitcoin forks. So, two things. One, Craig Wright's like comedic relief now, isn't he? Like, that's, just think about it. It's like, if, if that's actually Satoshi, this is just a really, really funny joke. Oh, yeah, um, no, no uh, that actually is. But, but two, we actually were really, like, we were really fortunate these forks ended up happening. We basically just took all of the caustic, underpinnings of what was happening as a result of the 2x and those dynamics and these people just kind of fucked off and did their own thing and like that was great for us it was like the, now that look at them they're all shooting each other in the head <laughs> yeah I, i'm go very back appreciative go back of to that slide yeah I, i'm very appreciative of the money that i made from you know the forks and stuff like that so um yeah I, I basically, I, I, I do think that a lot of the people that are, uh, you know, like doing these splits, it's, it's all about centralization and concentration of power and things like that. Um, I think it's inevitable that Craig Wright will manage to convince his community that he really is Satoshi and therefore he should have Satoshi's coins without the private keys. And that's, I, I think, inevitable. It's going to happen. Um, and that's that that's the game that they're playing they're all playing for a score at the end um you know the the personalities involved um you know they have big egos they feel um, a sense of entitlement and when you have centralized power to be grabbed that's where they're going to try to get their money and uh and that's what's happening right now in bch where amory sachet of uh, bitcoin abc and the developers of bitcoin abc want to get subsidized for what they're doing for, quote unquote, their community. Um, and Peter Risen and Roger Ver and a bunch of others are like, well, maybe not. Um, Roger has actually gone back and forth between the two camps, um, you know, claiming to be on one side and then the other and so on. But it, it looks like, at the very least, that some of the people are going to have some serious un egg on their face. And it might cause a split. It might also just end, the end with a couple of them just sort of leaving the community and fading into oblivion, though it's hard to see that of anyone like uh, the people that we're talking about, like Jihan Wu and uh, Amory Sachet and those people. So, um, yeah, it, it's, it's not going, I, I mean, it's the, you know, the, these people I think are more or less, they've been like divorced like three times now and yeah, it's it's like another time that they're gonna get divorced. I, it might be you, right? Like and at that point. Here's another one of Giacomo's classic tweets, uh, where he's just chatting with uh, Bcash developer, and then he replies, "No, that's not unfair. I don't accuse all of you of being liars. Only the leaders. Many of you are just stupid." <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And this really reminded me of the classic George Carlin joke that goes, think about how stupid the average person is and then realize that half of them are stupider than that. Um, Coin market cap <laughs> explained. <laughs> that I'm is correct. I'm kind of amazed that Peter Risen is still a thing. <laughs> like, uh, how? I mean, he... he had a lot of ideas. He's very kind of, um, he runs Bitcoin Unlimited. And yeah, I mean, I think the best thing that he proposed was actually when Ethereum was launched. He, he proposed Ethereum. And he, he was saying, 
I'm going to take out the pre-mine. I wish that project would have launched because that would have been really fun. All right, yeah, about that, but if I may, I'm going to open up the floor to questions. Sure. So just come up, and I'll give you guys the mic. And uh, But Jack, go ahead. So about forks, so-called forks, they are not actually forks. They are not code forks. They are not, the, uh, they are not like a consensus forks. They are just altcoins, which happen to be airdropped to people based on the snapshot of a UTXO Bitcoin at a certain point of time. So are airdrops uh, inherently bad? I would say yes, but not so bad. Like the, the worst thing that you can have is actually pre-mine an ICO scam, where people print money and sell this money uh, in order to reach themselves. Then you have something which is more fair, like the fair lunch, fair lunch of uh, green and stuff like that, which is not fair at all because you cannot do fair lunch now, but still you can mine, we can mine and can inflate the supply. Then better than that, there is the UTXO uh, airdrop, which at least will create inflation, but will distribute the inflation to current owners, making it basically economically neutral. So itself is not so bad. You can have two things even better, like you can have a, a proof of permanent proof of burn in which you create a new chain, and in order to get a coin on a new chain, you have to permanently burn a Bitcoin. So thank you for the deflation. It's like a one-way side chain. You go there, but you cannot get back. And then the best way to launch a new technology is a, a real two-way side chain where you can back, uh, go back and forth. So itself, uh, the airdrop is not so bad. The problem is that, is that was used to market, to market these, uh, these shit coins as something inherently different. And so there were people like, hey, I'm talking about Bitcoin in all these different flavors. No, those are just, uh, just shit coins, airdropped. The, the w what, uh, what I find very fascinating about uh, Bitcoin airdropped, uh, Bitcoin derived uh, scams is that uh, they, uh, they really struggle with logical consistency. Low, like you have, you have lo Roger, Ver, you have Roger Ver and Bcash, and they are like, uh, everything must be on chain because only on chain works. Lightning Network doesn't work, but we need the unconfir unconfirmed transactions. So unconfirmed transactions are good. Unconfirmed transactions are off chain by definition. They are the most on ch off chain thing you can have without any kind of, uh, of hope to get on chain. Uh, also, they have like, we want a real peer to peer cash. And then you have Lightning Network, which is really peer-to-peer, -peer, unlike Bitcoin, which is actually one-to-many, is not peer-to-peer. -peer. And then they are against Litecoin. So they are like a sea of logical contradiction. Oh, sorry. I can't yeah, because, li li because Lightning Network is a real Litecoin. So <laughs> OK, hello. So I think Lightning Network is uh, incredibly exciting. I think Lightning Network is incredibly exciting but I have some doubt about the claim that it can be uh, silver, um, and I hope you can address that. And that's because you need an on-chain transaction to get in and out of to get in and out of Lightning Network. You need an on-chain transaction, and so I'm wondering how that can be scalable to tens or hundreds of millions of people. I, I try to rephrase that more clearly. So. Uh, my problem with, uh, with the fact that uh, you use something as the transactional money is that you have to go from store of value to transactional, transact and back to store of value. So you're not saving anything, you're just spending more. So the only trick to avoid that is to batch long term. And to batch long term, you need to save long term. And so you need the same currency. In Lightning, you can take Bitcoin and auto storage, s uh, batch it in order to do the transactional stuff, and then getting it back to storage. And it's the same asset, so the price doesn't change. So you can keep it there because it's still a store of value because it's the same asset. With, uh, with Litecoin or Dogecoin or Dentacoin, which is my favorite among these three, you cannot, unfortunately. So that's why I say that, uh, of course, uh, it's still inflation uh, if, you, if, you, if you have silver. But if you consider the, the monetary mass of gold plus silver, then you have a, a rare metal, which is actually used for uh, uh, high divisibility, which is silver, and for high portability, which is gold. And the sum of these is still a, a capped uh, supply with a good overall hardness. Of course, gold a alone was harder, so it was better. And so when you didn't have the visibility, divisibility problem anymore, uh, uh, you switch to only gold. And Lightning has better divisibility than uh, on-chain Bitcoin. So in this sense, Lightning Network Bitcoin are the silver to on-chain Bitcoin because they have better divisibility, which is the problem with on-chain Bitcoin. The problem with the chain Bitcoin is that if I want to send you $3 million, that's very, very, very easy. If I want to send you one, one, uh, one, uh, one cent, that's problematic because on-chain fees can be more. With Lightning, I have the, the opposite problem. 
just like with silver. If I want to send you one cent over lightning, that's great. If I want to send you three millions over lightning, I'm screwed because there's no liquidity. I have to pay a lot of, in, in, in lightning, you pay for the liquidity. So basically you have a portability problem for large amounts. While on, on, on chain, you have a divisibility problem, just like silver and gold. Hi guys, I uh, love what you're saying out there, but you're all agreeing with each other a bit too much. So I'm gonna play the devil's advocate. Um, if you're saying Ethereum is so shit, uh, for want of a better word, why is it still worth 30 billion and why isn't it disappearing? Why is it taking so long? People love idols. Market, market state time. I mean, uh, how, how, mu how much time did it take for Terranos to go to, to that point to zero? Peta.com. Uh, sometimes it's two years, sometimes in one year, sometimes it's 10 years. Sometimes, as I said, you can have a scam going on for, uh, for several millenniums, but eventually reality catches up. I think uh, somebody once uh, posted, I think it was Max Hillerband, he, he said uh, if we think about the Bitcoin mining in the early years, there's so much inflation of the money supply being created, we can think about the Bitcoin economy suffering from the boom-bust cycles that you see in the regular economy with um, inflationary monetary policy because of all this new money creation. And in a sense, you know, th when all of this new money creation is happening, people will invest in all kinds of different things and you know, um, in the case of Bitcoin, the appreciation happened so quickly that a lot of people made very quick, very big gains without having to really work hard um, or having you know had a clear thesis or knowing exactly what they were doing. So when you have all that money lying around and all those people with all of that extra money that they made very quickly, it's uh, I it's a recipe for them to start investing in all kinds of different things, and so. Um, in, in a sense, these, um, I think, you know, it, it, it'll be interesting to see, I think, with time, as the amount of Bitcoin mining compared to the stockpile of Bitcoin declines further and further, that this notion of just uh, people, you know, the, the we run more and more away from the time where the people made a lot of money because they ran their computer for a few minutes or a few hours, made some Bitcoins, and then it turned out to be serious money. And now, you know, we go more to a world in which everybody who's made uh, money in Bitcoin had to make, you know, a serious investment with a serious amount of time. When the gains stop being as spectacular as they did, then you won't have as many people who are careless with their money in the space, and then you'd have much better capital allocation. So I think over time, a as Bitcoin becomes more scarce, we'll see people becoming more and more careful about uh, putting their coins in uh, such uh, Rube Goldberg machines. I mean, yeah. the minimum amount of misallocation will always be there. I mean, uh, we are in Las Vegas. I love Las Vegas. But you know, right, that playing with that stuff is not working. You know that they are losing money, right? That's <laughs> mathematically certain. <laughs> but that's going on since, since a lot of, uh, I mean, it's still going on. There is a lot of economy running. Uh, you cannot eradicate that. A minimum amount of misallocation of, of people that are just, they are just uh, buying a, a, an irreasonable hope will always be there. What is worrying in the crypto bullshit and industry is that uh, the, the amount of noise over ratio is too much. It's like if we had, uh, in, the, in the old world, we had more slot machine than, uh, I don't know, than, than pants or shoes. That, that's a problem, right? That's the crypto industry. You have as much slot machines as you have medicines. That's a problem. But uh, eventually, something will always remain uh, for, for stupid people. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the big thing is in your, the assumption in your question is why is it three, uh, you know, $30 billion market cap or whatever? The assumption in your question is that the markets are rational or that everything is priced in. That is not a safe assumption. Not everything is priced in, and the markets can stay very irrational for extended amounts of time. And that's what we, that's the situation that we have today, and that's the sort of thesis that I think everybody on this panel has. And if you're smart, I think that's the that that that's a thesis that you should have too. And yeah, you 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 have to you have to think about it from that perspective instead of the markets are perfectly rational and that the price reflects all the information that's in the market. It reflects some of it. Uh, it doesn't. Re it, it, but it also reflects like hopes and desires and rationalizations and all this other stuff that human beings have. Uh, some people uh, just to check on point. Uh, some people said that uh, Las Vegas is the city built on losers. So, and that has been going on for a couple of decades already. Um, just 
to Tone's comment in the beginning, um, I really invite everybody to uh, search. So, so the search term you want to do for this first usage of the word shitcoin is uh, Bitcoin is not ad advertised. And this post is from November 2010. Um, I'm not going to read it, but I encourage everybody to search it up because there's a, a quite a bit of good. This is at a time where there were like 2,000 users on Bitcoin Talk. And there was like no crypto Twitter, no Reddit, no nothing. So 2,000 people were pretty much the Bitcoin community. And uh, yeah, I would recommend anybody to read the post until maybe April 2013. A lot of discussions have been there. Everybody thinks they're novel, but they have been going on for decades, for almost a decade now. Just a quick comment, sorry. No question. No question. <laughs> All, right. All right, we got one last question or comment. You guys stand up, and then we're going to wrap it up. Uh, thank you very much, just guys, to conclude, I, wasn't a, uh, I think I wasn't able to pay attention the whole time, so I just wanted to ask, in your opinion, what's the best cryptocurrency to invest in and why do you think it's Ripple? <laughs> XRP. <laughs> Joke. The standard. <laughs> the hardest money is always the one that you should invest. Zaxbox.win. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you for everyone. And uh, nice co the All great right. conference town. Uh, thank you so much, guys. Um, I, I think it's a good note to wrap this up. And uh, we do have the after party in exactly one hour. Um, it's over at a place called The Nerd, which is perfect. Um, it's at a place called The Nerd. It's about a five minute walk. Uh, so look it up on the phone. We'll put it in the Telegram group. Uh, it's a really fun venue. Uh, there's free alcohol and some free food. Uh, so, but uh, you can also go and eat. You have an hour to relax and uh, meet us there around eight o'clock. We'll have open bar and uh, then we'll do the scammies from there. We'll have a couple of other announcements. We're going to auction off uh, one of these art pieces that every single or almost I think every single uh, speaker has already signed. Uh, these are the official art pieces for this conference. Yeah, opening bid, we got it. We'll do it at the after party, guys. We will uh, do a couple of auctions at the after party. Uh, we're also gonna, um, Ugly Old Goat um, has personally nominated this year's standard bearer. It was uh, Saifedean last year. Uh, and uh, we'll discuss that after the after party as well. I hope everybody goes. Uh, we'll have uh, Vesa, the artist, uh, make a little speech there as well. We'll uh, you can get your art there, correct? And like put up the paintings, perfect. Uh, so we'll meet you guys tonight. nerd. Thank you again for uh, coming to Unconfiscatable and supporting us. Hope you guys had a chance to talk to some of the vendors out in the back. And uh, see you guys next year. It'll be. Uh, approximately at the same time. We're going to announce the date a lot earlier. And uh, thank you all for showing up. And uh, thank you for the support. And thank you for watching the channel. It's been absolutely excellent. I also want to give a huge shout out to my team uh, or our team that helped put all of this together. As you guys know, all I do is travel. And uh, this would not have happened if I didn't have a team putting it all on. Uh, so thank you again. They're actually already over at the after party. Uh, so if there's any speakers that are still in the room, come up to the stage. We'll do a nice little group shot. I see Willie in the back there. Oh, you haven't? Oh, okay, uh, come to the after party. We'll do it there. I gotta get Johnny Dilly to sign it. Um, no, no, not this one. We have the signed one in the back, but this is the this is the non-signed version. There's only 50 of these. I, oh. I don't think anybody signed this one. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, there's a bunch. Oh, no, no, no. Everyone's there. Not Max, literally, so there's, there's 50 of these. So uh, you signed uh, okay. another version of this one. Did you okay. do it now? Uh, no, yeah. no, but it's not well, this well, one. Oh, but it's your QR no, code. No, yeah, it's yeah. also not this particular one. Oh, it's right, exactly. okay. Yeah, yeah, it's the one you have. Yeah. Um, so if there's any speakers, come out to the stage. We'll do a little group shot. No, can I be here? Can, uh, you can be here or take a picture. <laughs> um, also, can someone help me hold this thing? Thank you. <laughs> oh, here comes Jack. Jack coming. Adam coming. Anyone else? Adam. 
Adam, come on up for a picture. Adam? Yeah. Just those people. people know what he looks like. Right, There's Willie. Willie. Okay. There's Peter. Peter no, Todd. No, Peter's Peter coming. Todd. Yeah. Did you just tell David to stand on a chair because he's short? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's a chair. <laughs> awesome. Thank you guys. Oh, the small prints are available for sale, 0 0.05 Bitcoin. And there's three large originals. One will be auctioned off at the after party. Another one is up for sale for one Bitcoin. And the third one has already been sold. Normally, these are 